A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 6th of April 2022. See displayed here are the list of news articles that I have chosen for today's discussion. See today's discussion is really going to be very useful for both your prelims as well as mains. And as I always assure you, I have an economic topic today also. It is regarding the concept of fiscal consolidation. Then in that itself, I had covered about fiscal deficit and how to address the fiscal deficit. Okay. And the first news article that I have chosen for today's discussion is very much important for both your prelims and mains. Keeping in mind that prelims is fast approaching, I had made a point to cover all important points that can be put in your prelims questions. Okay. And in the other two articles also, I had made a point to give more importance for your prelims. So without wasting much time, now let's get into the first news article discussion. Now take a look at this editorial article. See this editorial article talks about secularism. I hope you all remember the recent hijab issue that was raised in the state of Karnataka. And when the issue was taken to the Karnataka High Court, it could not settle the issue. The judgment of the High Court was very technical. It nearly read like a petition and it revealed an excessive desire to disprove the opposing viewpoint. Hence, its judgment further provoked the hijab wearing college students in Udupi. As a result, no, they have now approached the Supreme Court of India to contest the order. So, this is the crux of the article given here. See, you very well know that this topic secularism is very much important for your mains. But note that the philosophy of secularism is very much important for your prelims also because questions based on that is coming nowadays. And also the constitutional provisions regarding secularism can be asked as a preliminary question. So this topic is going to be relevant for both your prelims as well as mains. Kindly pay attention and make note of each and every point that is going to be mentioned in this discussion. Okay. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference. Just go through it. See, to begin with, what is secularism? Secularism in simple term refers to separation of religion from the state. Or you can say it is a normative doctrine which seeks to realize a secular society. That is, a society that is devoid of either interreligious or intra-religious dominations. See, to put positively, it promotes freedom within religions and equality between as well as within religions. Now, what kind of state is necessary to realize these goals? The answer is very simple. To realize secularism, we need a secular state. Now, when you look at the constitution of India, it stands for a secular state. Hence, it does not uphold any particular religion as the official religion of the Indian state. Now we are going to see some of the provisions of the Indian constitution that reveals the secular character of the Indian state. Firstly, as you know, originally the constitution provided for seven fundamental rights under part 3 of the Indian constitution from articles 12 to 35. One among the fundamental rights is the right to freedom of religion which includes articles from 25 to article 28. Remember this fundamental right is available not only for citizens of India but also for the foreigners. See all persons are equally entitled to freedom of conscience and the right to freely profess, practice and propagate any religion. This is under article 25. Then when you take article 26, it says every religious denominations or any of its section shall have the right to manage its religious affairs. Then if you take article 27, it says no person shall be compelled to pay any tax for the promotion of a particular religion. And lastly, when you take article 28, it says no religious instruction shall be provided in any educational institution maintained by the state. Here, you must note one thing. The constitution originally or even under fundamental rights does not explicitly mention the term secularism or secular state. There is no doubt that constitution makers wanted to establish such a state under article 25 to 28 which is guaranteeing the fundamental right that is freedom of religion. But still the constitution does not explicitly mention that India is a secular state. 
See, wait, wait. It is for this reason only the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act was made. So, according to this 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act, the term secular was added to the preamble of the Indian Constitution itself. Okay. So far, we specifically saw about the provisions of the Indian Constitution, which are explicitly projecting India as a secular state. See, apart from this, there are many other provisions of the Indian Constitution which are implicitly projecting India as a secular state. Now, let us see them one by one. See, in preamble, in addition to the term secular state, there is also liberty of belief, faith and worship. This is implicitly mentioning that India is a secular state. And when you take Article 14, it says, The state shall not deny to any person equality before law and equal protection of the laws. See, here they are meaning to say that a person from a particular religion is not given high status. He is treated equally before law. Okay. Now, when you take Article 15, it says that the state shall not discriminate against any citizen on the ground of religion. And when you take Article 16, it says the equality of opportunity for all citizens in the matters of public employment should be provided. And when you take Article 29, it says any section of the citizen shall have the right to conserve its distinct language, script or culture. Then when you take Article 30, all the minorities shall have the right to establish and administer the educational institution of their choice. Lastly, when you take Article 44, yes, you are right, it is regarding DPSP. It has also made a provision like that. The state shall endeavor to secure for all the citizens a uniform civil code. So, having seen the provisions of the Indian Constitution, now let us move on to the important part of the discussion. That is, the Indian philosophy of secularism. See, the Indian concept of secularism differs from the Western concept of secularism. This is because the Western concept of secularism connotes a complete separation between the religion and the state. See, this is reflecting a negative concept of secularism and it is inapplicable in the Indian situation because the society here is multi-religious. Hence, the Indian constitution embodies the positive concept of secularism. That is, giving equal respect to all religions or protecting all religions equally. To put it in simple words, India as a secular state do not interfere with religion or religious activities and faith. Also note that any religion or religious activities or faith does not play any role in law and policy making decisions. But still, India respects all religion and protects all religion equally. Okay. Now coming back to the news article. See, according to the author, the issue of the hijab is political as well as constitutional. The top court, that is the Supreme Court, might examine the constitutional aspect and its judgment will hopefully settle the issue. But the political dimension of the hijab issue will continue to trouble the Indian society for a long time. See, the author says so because, according to him, the sudden eruption of the issue is nothing but a reflection of a widespread intolerance among the people. This is true because, as a matter of fact, Hindu and Sikh women in northern India cover their heads on all important occasions such as marriage, a funeral, a religious ceremonies, etc, etc. But still wearing hijab in school premise became an issue. The fact that a piece of cloth is enough to provoke people to rush out onto the street and fight each other is a witness to the transformation that has occurred in the Indian society. See, the transformation that I'm mentioning here is an environment of intolerance, okay? See, in this situation, the claims of traditional tolerance, pluralism seems like a bad joke. Now, the threat here is there is too much religiosity in public life in India. So, we have conveniently changed the meaning of secularism into Sarva Dharma Sambhav, which would only lead to majoritarianism and ultimately to the establishment of a theocratic state. See, what is this theocratic state? A state governed directly by a priestly order is called a theocratic state. See, if such a thing happens, theocracy will ensure the disintegration of the country. In the Indian context, 
a theocratic state based on the religious scriptures would be fundamentally unstable since it would deny the subaltern class equality before the law and equal protection under the law not only this they also lead to discrimination against them on the basis of caste see this may lead to long lasting conflicts and the eventual disintegration of the society will happen so by now you would have understood that disturbing the secularism of india is equal to threatening the very base of the society so this moves us to the question of way forward now what should be done we must come to the obvious conclusion that india as a nation can only survive as a secular state that is there should be no religious promotion by the state see according to the author the fact that educated indians mock secularism and have come to endorse the idea of theocratic state based on the dominant religion is an indication of people's thoughtlessness see this educated indians mood is being shaped by the confusing religio political campaigns see remember why secularism was chosen by indian leaders see secularism was chosen as a foundational principle of the republic to keep the nation united hence enlightened citizen should understand that if secularism is abandoned the country's hard won unity will be endangered so as a citizen of india every citizen has a patriotic duty to strengthen secularism and thereby safeguard the nation so that's all about this news article we discussed about what is secularism especially we discussed about the indian philosophy of secularism then we saw about the constitutional provisions which talks about the secularism we saw both explicit mentioning and implicit mentioning okay then we saw the threat to secularism and what will be the cause of that threat lastly we saw what should be done as a citizen of india to protect secularism so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion look at this article here it is about the purchase of brahmos missiles by philippines from india see we all know that brahmos supersonic cruise missile was a joint development between india and russia but the purchase of the cruise missile by philippines from india is notable here this is because India would be able to move ahead on a bilateral basis with Philippines. So this is the essence of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn more about missiles from prelims perspective. Here I'll be covering about the types of missiles, then I'll also cover about BrahMos missile in prelims perspective, okay? First of all, let us see what is a missile. See, a missile is nothing but an object such as a weapon. thrown or projected this is thrown or projected in order to strike something at a distance which is a target okay see it is usually a rocket which carries a payload with the aim of destroying the target there are different types of missiles on the basis of launch mode no they are classified as surface to surface air to surface then surface to air missiles then air to air missiles then you can also say anti satellite weapons missiles okay see as far as the types are concerned no they are very easy because you can understand from the name itself what is the type and what is its mechanism okay now for example take the surface to surface missile it means the rocket is propelled from the ground and it hits a target on the ground okay likewise you take the air to air missile it means it is propelled from a jet and it will hit the target which is in the air see the target might be another jet or something else okay now when you take the air to surface missile it means they are propelled from a jet and it hits a target on the ground can you understand from the name itself you can understand the mechanism of their launch am i right that is why this is a very easy classification and when you take the surface to air now you say what happens here it is just opposite to air to surface that is the missile is propelled from the surface and it hits the target in the air okay then you may ask what are ballistic missile cruise missile anti ship or anti tank missiles wait let us discuss about each of these one by one 
First, let us see about the ballistic missile. See, the ballistic missile is targeted as a projectile from a single launch force. See, here not much guidance is added, okay? And it is launched directly into the high layers of the Earth's atmosphere. It travels well outside the atmosphere and then the warhead detaches and falls back to Earth. See, the ballistic missile follows the path of a ball thrown upwards which falls down. See, when you throw a ball, how does it go? Do you remember that path? In a similar way, the ballistic missile will travel. Okay. Since it depends on gravity to reach its target, it is called as ballistic missile. See, ballistic missiles can travel extremely quick along their flight path. With the terminal speeds of over 5000 meter per second, the ballistic missiles are much harder to intercept than the cruise missile. See, this is due to the much shorter time available. Okay. See, these ballistic missiles are some of the most feared weapons that are available and it can be launched from ships and they can also be land-based facilities. Okay. Now, based on the range, you know, we can classify this ballistic missile as short range, medium range, then intermediate range. And lastly, you can also go for intercontinental ballistic missile. These are all the types of ballistic missile based on range. Okay. Some examples of ballistic missiles in India are Agni 1, Agni 2, then Prithvi 1, Prithvi 2 and Danush. Okay. Now let's see about the cruise missiles. A cruise missile is a guided missile. That means the target has to be preset. It is used against terrestrial targets. See here when you take the cruise missiles, they are generally consisting of a guidance system in addition to the payload and aircraft propulsion system. And note that these cruise missiles are housed in an airframe with small wings and appanage. See, appanage is nothing but an arrangement of stabilizing the surface at the tail of an aircraft. This is mainly for flight control, okay? Now, when you take these cruise missiles, they can be launched from various platforms. That means they can be landed from land or sea. Sea here means they can be submarine launch or ship launch. Then they can be launched from air also. Okay. See, these cruise missiles are characterized by having different forms of guidance, such as satellite GPS guidance. Then they are known specifically for the low level flight, which is staying relatively close to the surface of the earth. This is mainly you know, to avoid the detection from anti-missile systems and they are designed to carry large payloads with high precision. Okay. See, the key is that the missile is guided entirely to the target under its own power. Okay. The cruise missiles can be categorized by size, speed. When you talk about speed, no, you can call them as supersonic, subsonic or hypersonic cruise missiles. And it can also be classified based on range. And from where it can be launched, that is from land or air or surface or ship or submarine, whatever it may be. Okay. See, when you take the land attack missiles, they are the cruise missiles which are designed to hit stationary or moving targets on land. Okay. Now, let me tell you about the anti-tank missile. See, anti-tank guided missile, anti-tank missile, anti-tank guided weapon or anti-armor guided weapon. All these are guided missile primarily designed to hit and destroy heavily armored military vehicles. Okay. When you ask me a few examples, I can tell you two. Nag and Helena, which are the examples of anti-tank missiles in India. Okay. And now let me tell you about the anti-ship missile. See, these are a guided missile that is designed for use against ships and large boats. See, all these ballistic, cruise, anti-ship and anti-tank missiles are under the broad category, which is surface to surface, surface to air or air to air or air to surface. It means... All ballistic crews, anti-ship, anti-tank missiles, all these can be launched from surface. Okay. Now coming back to the article. See the article is about the missile BrahMos. So let us see a few important facts about the BrahMos missile which are very much important for your preliminary examination. See the missile 
has been developed as a joint venture between the DRDO and the Federal State Unitary Enterprise NPO Mashnio Stroinia. See, if you find it difficult to remember this enterprise name, just have in mind that it is a Russian based enterprise. And remember, this BrahMos is the first supersonic missile known to be in service. BrahMos is a two-stage supersonic cruise missile which is a solid propellant booster engine. As its first stage which brings it to the supersonic speed and then gets separated. So remember, its first stage is a solid propellant. Okay. Then the liquid ramjet or the second stage, no, then takes the missile closer to... 3 max speed. See the missile is fitted with stealth technology and guidance systems with advanced embedded software which provides the missiles with special features. Now what is the stealth technology? See it is very simple. A stealth technology is intended to make vehicles or missiles nearly invisible to the enemy radar or other electronic detection. So you can call the stealth technology as a invisible technology. Okay. See the missile maintains supersonic speed all through the flight leading to a shorter flight time. See it is capable of being launched from submarine ships, fighter jets or land. And it operates on fire and forget principle adopting varieties of flights on its way to the target. What is this fire and forget principle? See, the fire and forget principle of operation means the missile guidance does not require further guidance. That is once it is launched and until it hits the target, it doesn't require any guiding system. And note that the launcher need not be in the line of sight of the target. Understood? So, this BrahMos is performing under this fire and forget principle of operation. Okay. See, the destructive power of BrahMos is enhanced due to large kinetic energy on impact. And that's all about this news article. We saw everything about the types of missile and what is a missile. Then how from the name itself you can understand what is the mechanism of the missile. Then lastly, we saw about the BrahMos missile. See, this topic is very much important for your prelims because you can expect this kind of questions. So, with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, look at this news article. See, this article is from the business page in the Hindu paper. And you know, it's hard to miss this kind of article. See, this article is about borrowing. The article says that according to S&P Global Ratings, global sovereign borrowing will reach $10.4 trillion in 2022. That is almost a third above average before the COVID-19 pandemic. And the rating agency said that despite an economic recovery, borrowing will stay elevated because of high debt rollover requirements and the war in Ukraine. See, the conditions that are prevailing globally is spoken in this news article. When we talk about borrowing, no, we should always think of fiscal consolidation. Because when the borrowing increases, the country's debt is increasing. Thus, to prevent this from happening, fiscal consolidation must be done. So, now comes the question here. What is fiscal consolidation? See, to know about fiscal consolidation, you should know about fiscal deficit. The word fiscal refers to annual government account statements and the word deficit stands for shortage. Therefore, fiscal deficit is a term used to define the difference between what a government spends and what it collects as revenue. Now you may wonder how can government spend beyond its revenue? It is by means of borrowing. So in simple words, a fiscal deficit situation occurs when the government spends more than what it earns. This deficit is calculated in absolute terms and also as a percentage of gross domestic product or GDP of the country. For example, if the GDP of a country is 100 lakh crore and the difference between total income and expenditure is 10 lakh crore, then the fiscal deficit is 10 percentage. See, if a country has a large and recurring fiscal deficit, it shows that the government has been spending beyond what it gets as revenue. When you talk about India, the fiscal deficit is the king indicator to show the fiscal health of the government. 
effectively fiscal deficit indicates the amount of government borrowing for that particular year am i right excess fiscal deficit produces some adverse effects for the government it causes interest payment burden and for the economy it causes inflationary effect and rising interest rate in the economy so by this time you would have understood what is this fiscal deficit and what are all the troubles that it is causing and how it is managed it is managed through borrowing so what can be done to control all these problems here comes the answer fiscal consolidation see fiscal consolidation refers to the ways and means of narrowing the fiscal deficit see a government typically borrows to bridge the deficit it will then have to allocate a part of its earning to service the debt am i right so the interest burden will increase as the debt increases see when you take the budget for the financial year 2022 of the total government expenditure of over 34.83 lakh crore more than 8.09 lakh crore that is around 20% went towards interest payments alone see this debt is one liability that is difficult to defer and at the end of the day the government struggles to find more resources not just for capital expenditure but also for revenue expenditure so in the long run uncontrolled fiscal deficit will hurt economic growth Now let us see the measures from the expenditure side and the revenue side that are envisaged by the government to achieve this fiscal consolidation or what we call it as narrowing the fiscal deficit. Firstly, there should be improvement in the tax revenue realization. For this, increasing efficiency of tax administration by reducing tax avoidance then eliminating tax evasion then enhancing tax compliances etc etc are to be made secondly there should be enhancement in the tax gdp ratio this is done by widening the tax base and minimizing the tax concessions and exemptions see all these will improve tax revenue am i right So now the third measure is better targeting of government subsidies and extending the direct benefit transfer scheme for more subsidies. See when the government makes the target for subsidies specific and efficient then definitely the income from the particular sector will enhance the country's economy. Else it is only going to increase the deficit of the country. Okay? See the higher economic growth rate will help government to get higher tax revenues as well. So augmentation of tax revenue is necessary to bring fiscal consolidation as there are limitations for reducing government expenditure in India. Note that announcing fiscal consolidation plans and measures is a prerequisite to restore public finances. Also it helps to maintain market confidence. See when a country is having more and more percentage of fiscal deficit then who will be confident enough to invest in the country no countries or no companies will be ready to invest right so in order to maintain market confidence also a country should be fiscal deficit free or at least it should be reduced to certain level that is why this fiscal consolidation is very much important See, it aims at reducing the government deficit and debt accumulation. Okay, so that's all about this news article. I hope you'd have understood about the term fiscal deficit. Then what are all the causes? Then what are all the troubles it is causing? Then how it is managed? Then finally, I hope you'd have understood about the term fiscal consolidation. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. See this news article talks about a report released by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That is shortly called as IPCC report. As you know, IPCC is the United Nations body in charge of evaluating the science related to climate change. This news article is most significant in that manner. So in this background, let us quickly go through the findings of the report. Before that, have this basic understanding see recently released a report is nothing but a summary report this summary for policy makers summarizes major conclusions 
from the working group 2's contribution to the IPCC 6th assessment report. Okay. The report actually highlights the connection of climate, ecosystem and biodiversity as well as human societies and integrates knowledge more strongly across the natural, ecological, social and economic sciences. This is more efficient than the previous IPCC's assessment. You can see it in the image given here. See from this image itself you can understand how efficiently the report is getting transformed. See the climate change causes, impacts and risks on one side and the future climate change limiting the global warming is on the other side. So what are all the timely action required can be listed out by each and every government across the globe and thus the global warming can be addressed. Or in simple words, this report evaluates the physical signs of climate change looking at the past, present and future climate. It reveals how human caused emissions are altering our planet and what that means for our collective future. Talking about the highlights of the report, see the latest report has for the first time made an assessment of regional and sectoral impacts of the climate change. It has included risk to and vulnerabilities of mega cities around the world. For example, it has said Mumbai is at high risk of sea level rise and flooding, while Ahmedabad faces serious danger of heat waves. For the first time, the IPCC report has looked at the health impacts of climate change. For example, it has found that the climate change is increasing vector-borne and waterborne diseases such as malaria or dengue particularly in subtropical regions of Asia. And secondly, if you take, it has also said deaths related to circulatory, respiratory, diabetic and infectious diseases as well as infant mortality are likely to increase with a rise in temperature. Then thirdly, the increasing frequency of extreme weather events like heat waves, flooding and drought and even air pollution was contributing to undernutrition, allergic diseases and even mental disorders. So talking about India specific study, see the report identifies India as one of the vulnerable hotspots with several regions and important cities facing very high risk of climate disasters. For example, the climate disasters such as flooding, sea level rise and heat waves are getting more and more. See, I already mentioned that Mumbai is at high risk of sea level rise and flooding and Ahmedabad is facing serious danger of heat waves. Okay. Then several cities including Chennai, Bhuneshwar, Patna and Lucknow are approaching dangerous levels of heat and humidity. See, infrastructure including transportation, water and sanitation and energy systems has been compromised by extreme and slow onset events. This further results in economic losses, disruption of services and impacts the well-being of the humans. See, we know that urban India is at greater risk than other areas with a projected population of 877 million by 2050. See, this is nearly double of 480 million in the year 2020. Okay, so that's all about this news article. So we had discussed about the IPCC report which is very much important for your prelims and I had given the key findings of the recent report. Just keep those key points in mind. It will be very much useful in addressing your prelims based questions. Okay. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion. Now look at this first question. It is regarding the BrahMos missile that we discussed today. See, it is a two statement question. So, you have to go through both the statements before answering this question. Okay. Now, look at the first statement. It is absolutely incorrect because we saw that the BrahMos is a two stage supersonic cruise missile with a solid propellant booster engine as its first stage. So, why is this statement wrong? It says that BrahMos is an intercontinental ballistic missile. So, it is absolutely incorrect. Okay. And the second part, no, which is talking about the range, it is also incorrect because the liquid ramjet or the second stage of this BrahMos cruise missile takes the missile closer to 3 max speed in cruise phase. Okay. So, the first statement here is incorrect. Now, take the second statement. It is correct. 
because this we saw in our discussion itself that the missile has been developed as a joint venture between the DRDO and I said one enterprise name right Federal State Unitary Enterprise NPO Mashinos Terrania simply you can remember that it is a Russian enterprise okay so this is the first supersonic missile known to be in service okay and see now read the complete question it is asking for correct statement so your answer here will be option B Two only is the correct statement. Okay. Now look at this second question. See, consider the following statement with reference to the type of deficits. So three statements are given. See, whenever you have more than two statements, you can opt for elimination technique. Whenever I get this kind of questions, no, I always go in for third statement or second statement. So let me take the third statement today. See the primary deficit is the difference between revenue deficit and grants for creation of capital asset. This statement is absolutely incorrect because the definition given there is a definition of effective revenue deficit. Yes, effective revenue deficit is the difference between revenue deficits and grants for the creation of capital assets. Okay, then what is the definition of primary deficit? See, primary deficit is nothing but the difference between the fiscal deficit of the current year and the interest paid by the government on loans obtained in the past. Okay. So, now you know that statement 3 is incorrect. You can eliminate 3 options that is B, C, D and you can easily find the answer as option A, 1 and 2 only. But always read the other statements also before confirming the answer. Now, look at the first statement. Fiscal deficit is the difference between the total income of the government and its total expenditure. Yes, it is correct. Now look at the second statement. Revenue deficit arises when the government's revenue expenditure exceeds the total revenue receipts. Yes, absolutely correct. Okay. So your answer for this question is option A. 1 and 2 only is the correct statement. Okay. Now look at the third question. See, it is regarding our IPCC report discussion. Okay. It is a two statement question. So, I are going to go through both the statements before answering this question. Look at the first statement. It is correct because we saw in our discussion itself that IPCC is a United Nation body in charge of evaluating the science related to climate change. Okay. So, statement one is correct. Now, look at the second statement. See, it says that it was established by United Nations General Assembly and the World Meteorological Organization in 1988. This statement is incorrect because it was established by UNEP that is United Nations Environment Program and the World Meteorological Organization in the year 1988. It was only endorsed by the UN General Assembly. Okay. So, the question is demanding for the correct statements. Your answer will be option A, one only is a correct statement. Okay. Now I have displayed here a mains question. Please go through the question and write your answers and post it in the comment section. And if you have any doubts regarding the discussion, you can post all your doubts in the comment section and it will be clarified as soon as possible. If you like this video, do like, share and comment and don't forget to subscribe to the Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.